This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. It's my pleasure to introduce Nathaniel Katz, who is a recent PhD from the University of Texas at Austin. He just defended his dissertation on uh, interregna, the periods between emperors, especially violent transitions uh, in classical studies at UT Austin in May. And now he's a lecturer at the University of Arizona. And he was with us here uh, this summer, uh, part of the 2019, or sorry, 2020 class that never got to come because of COVID. Uh, and so he came this summer as part of the uh, summer seminar and worked on um, legionary coins, uh, specifically these coins with standards and referred oftentimes to specific legions. Uh, and uh, that was his research project and uh, what he will be uh, presenting on uh, today. So with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Katz. Thank you for that introduction. And I'm glad to be back at the ANS even after just a few weeks away and virtually. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, hopefully you can all see it. Okay. So I'm gonna be talking about legionary coins and most of them are going to look like the four examples you can see here. So that's to say in the middle, they're going to have a legionary eagle or aquila and on either side, you're going to have a standard or the signum. And these are what Roman soldiers would follow into battle. And some of these coins as you can see have the name of a legion written on them and some of them don't. And we'll talk about why over the course of this. But by far the most famous person to issue these, uh, issued the one in the top left here, Mark Antony. And as we'll talk about, he issued a gigantic series of legionary coins. And because of that, whenever you read about the imperial legionary coins that came after him, the first thing that you read is that they are allusions to Mark Antony. And if the article or book you're reading has a second sentence on them, it usually says that they honor the depicted soldiers. So a coin that says Legion VI is in honor of Legion VI. Both of those statements are completely true and I'm not here to disprove either of them. But I think there's a lot more we can say about these coins, especially if you view them as a group. Uh, so first of all, I'm gonna show today that they are strongly associated with civil war, particularly their resurgence on the Imperial coinage after Antony. They also pop up uh, with reference to military colonies and other Roman conquests. That's not as much my focus, but I'll cover it to contextualize the Civil War coins. And these coins don't just appear as like little blips about Mark Antony or about the Sixth Legion. Like any coin, they're part of an overall uh, numismatic and political program. And I'll show that these legionary coins are tied to the issuing emperor's overall messages. Finally, before long, there's a large enough body of imperial legionary coins that, well, yes, these coins are referring to Antony, they're also referring to each other and become a way that emperors can set themselves up uh, with reference to their predecessors. So let's look at the most famous example of legionary coins. And Mark Antony isn't the first person to use this eagle and standards iconography but he's the first person to use the names of particular legions on it. And in a flood of legionary coins uh, for a very long time, basically buries the memory of the people who minted legionary coins before him. Because Mark Antony, before he battles Octavian, the future emperor Augustus at Actium, he mints coins in the name of each of his legions, as well as his praetorian bodyguards and the speculatores who are a unit of scouts. He mints so many of these coins that horrid evidence suggests he is minting 10 of these for every one contemporary coin Octavian is minting. And he makes a very fateful decision. He mints these on the Sistophoric standard because he's based on the East, which means these have less silver in them than a contemporary coin minted in Rome on the Roman standard. Mark Antony, of course, loses the Battle of Actium. And in its wake, Octavian decides to pay the, ret uh, the retirement bonuses of his legionaries. And remember, he now has twice as many legionaries because Mark Antony's legions are now under his command. So he's paying a massive number of retirement bonuses. He pays those bonuses 
in Mark Antony's legionary coins. And we know this from the evidence of Augustan era hordes from veteran colonies in Italy, where clearly Mark Antony wasn't settling anybody in Italy. Why would Augustus pay his soldiers or the future emperor Augustus in the coins of his beaten opponent? Well, remember, these have less silver than the coins Octavian is minting, which means were he to remint these in his own coin types, he would be losing money with every coin he reminted. But the effect of that is he de facto legitimizes them. And these coins are going to stay in circulation because over the next century, as emperor after emperor debases the coinage, sometimes gradually, sometimes not so gradually, earlier better coins drop out of circulation in accordance with Gresham's law. Mark Antony's legionary coins don't because they basically come pre-debased. They already have less silver. The result of that is if you lived in the time of Vespasian, something like one in five silver coins you would see would be a Mark Antony legionary denarius. And they continue to circulate in numbers into the third century, though by then they're so worn down that most people probably can't read them. So clearly, yes, if you are in the time of Vespasian and you see another legionary coin, you're going to think about Mark Antony because they're so incredibly common. Now, before I dive deeper into how later emperors mint these, I want to subdivide the category a little. Going forward, I'm going to refer to legionary coins, uh, or I'm going to call legionary coins, what we see on the left here, which is a coin that has this iconography I've been talking about with the eagle and the standards and names a particular legion. Coins that have the same iconography, but do not name a particular legion, I'm going to refer to as eagle and standard coins. And then on the right, you can see an example of what I'm going to call a three standards coins. As the name implies, it's just a coin with three standards. Some of them, like this one, do have a smaller eagle on top of the middle standard. I'll talk as I go about why an emperor would mint one or another of these, but I think it's important to have all three types in mind because some scholarship dives really deep on legionary coins. But as we'll see, their story is closely intertwined with the story of the Eagle and Standards coins. So the first people to follow Mark Antony in minting these are actually not the emperors, but it's rather Roman military colonies. And why a military colony would mint a coin like this is, I think, pretty clear. It has them on it. This is a chance to put the legion you served in on the coin of your colony. The attraction is, I think, obvious, and they feel like they can do so because, after all, but when they retired, Octavian paid their retirement bonus in these coins. He can't be mad at the iconography. So all provincial legionary coins come from veteran colonies. Most provincial eagle and standards coins come from colonies. Uh, as you'll note from the list of exceptions, most of these are Flavian or later. And as I'm going to talk about soon, by the Flavian period, I think the type is a little less darkly associated with civil war and Mark Antony, that leaves the Nero type. And we'll see Nero is actually the first emperor to mint these, but Antioch mints them before Nero. Why? I was confused about this, but when I went to read the scholars who primarily work on uh, Antioch's coinage, they regard it as a simple variant of the much more common uh, Antioch eagle and thunderbolt. So this might be basically an example of parallel evolution. They're more interested in the eagle and, okay, there's some stuff on the sides. But what are the emperors doing this whole time? So until Nero, as I said, no emperor mints legionary or eagle and standards coins. Part of the reason is that the Julio-Claudians are less enthusiastic about openly celebrating the military on their coins than some later dynasties will be. But the larger reason is simply the most famous issuer of the type was Mark Antony. And Mark Antony's reputation is complicated under the Julio-Claudians. In the lead up to Actium, Octavian real, uh, wages a ferocious propaganda campaign against Cleopatra and Mark Antony. And the Senate gets the message, and after Actium, or maybe after Antony's death, they condemn Antony's memory. His images are taken down, his name is chiseled off of inscriptions, his family can't even use the prinome in Marcus anymore. 
But very quickly, Octavia nuances this extreme uh, stance on the past. And in fact, we see the name of Antony reinscribed on some of the very monuments from which it had just been chiseled in Octavian's lifetime. Okay, why would he do this? Well, we have to remember that his sister Octavia was married to Mark Antony and had children with him. And more than that, she takes it upon herself to raise not only her children with Antony, but the children Antony had with his other wives, Cleopatra and Fulvia. So to condemn Antony would be to condemn some of Octavian or Augustus's own relatives. And in fact, by a frankly delightful quirk of history, those children by and large go on to become the Julio-Claudian dynasty. Tiberius is in fact the last Julio-Claudian emperor to not be a descendant of Mark Antony. Already under him, though, we can see Antony's memory is multifaceted. So Tiberius's heir for a time is Germanicus, who was a descendant of Antony, and whom Tacitus tells us takes pride in his descent from both Augustus and Antony. However, at the same time, we can see that the sort of official panegyrical historiography, which we see in Valeus Paterculus, scapegoats Antony for the whole civil war and says Octavian didn't want it, it's Antony's fault that so many Romans died. With Caligula, we get the first emperor who is himself a descendant of Antony. And Suetonius tells us that one year Caligula stripped the consuls of their office because they celebrated Actium and thereby dishonored the memory of Caligula's ancestor, Antony. And from this, some scholars conclude that Caligula is re uh, embracing and reestablishing Antony's good name. And this is often tied up with the idea of Caligula embracing a more Antony-esque Hellenistic style of kingship rather than Augustan president. But there are a lot of problems with this theory. Starting with the fact that Dio has a very different uh, version of the story with the consuls. According to Cassius Dio, Caligula had planned to strip the consuls of their office regardless. Had they not celebrated Actium, they were gonna lose their office because they dishonored Augustus. The question of Antony was just a pretext. More broadly, as Anthony Barrett points out, there's no other evidence of Caligula embracing Mark Antony's memory. And in fact, it's not until Claudius that Mark Antony's birthday is once more celebrated. Happy birthday, Antony. That brings us to Nero, the last of the Julio Claudians. Now, there are a whole host of stories told about both Nero and Antony that paint them as the same kind of Greek-loving, fun-loving, drunk, popular guy. For example, there are stories that they both dress up in Greek clothing and watch Greek wrestling matches and sometimes take part in the matches themselves. There are also stories that they both tried to give a gift by piling a heap of coins on a table, and when onlookers were scandalized by the size of the heap, they said, you're right, we should double it. However, it's worth noting that the literary sources that tell us these stories about both men uniformly disapprove of these stories. So while Antony and Nero are sometimes compared, the comparison is not always positive. Antony's memory remains controversial. But Nero brings us to the first imperial eagle and standards coin. So the reverse of it has no legend, but it doesn't actually need one. Uh, so before Antony innovated by putting the names of the legions on coins, Eagle and Standard's coins had legends that identified who the commander of the army was. Nero doesn't need that because if you turn the coin over, you see his portrait and his titles. And it's those titles that allow us to get a first idea of when this coin was issued. The use of Imperator as a prinomen means that the coin was issued in 66 or later. As you're no doubt aware, in the year 68, Vindex and Galba rebel against Nero and ultimately dethrone him, and Galba becomes emperor. So, since Mattingly, there was a temptation to see this as a civil war coin. However, viewing it as a civil war coin is both very promising and very complicated, because the rebels, as we're going to see, mint an extremely similar coin, one that is clearly in dialogue with Nero's coin. The rebel coins are very Republican, uh, by which I mean that they avoid using any, uh, they, rebels do not put their own names on the coins and they do not put their portraits on the coins. Uh, for that reason, we call them anonymous. 
as you can imagine, anonymous coins lead to all sorts of problems with attribution and data. Now, normally, the anonymous coins are put into five groups. Some are minted in Spain by Galba. Some are minted in Gaul by Vindex. There is a group of what we call Augustus coins that have the portrait and sometimes titles of Augustus, but judging by their weight, were clearly not minted by Augustus. And so we usually assume they're minted by one of these rebel groups. I'll talk about an example of that type in a bit. There's a military series of coins minted by Vitellius. And finally, there are coins, so the theory goes, by the Batavian rebels. This is the division that you'll see if you look at, for instance, Roman imperial coinage. And according to this division, uh, the rebel eagle and standards coin comes in the second group by Vindex. But if you go with that attribution, as Colin Cray does, he then points out that there are serious chronological problems with viewing it as a response to Nero's coin and Nero's coin as a civil war coin. So let's look at the chronology briefly. Nero's coin is minted in 66 or later. Vindex rebels in March 68. But by the end of April or mid-May, Vindex is dead. So Cray doesn't think that there is time for Nero's coin to be a Civil War coin. Because were it to be, what would have to happen is that between March and mid-May at the latest, Vindex would have to rebel. Nero would have to hear about the rebellion. Nero would have to issue his coin. That coin would have to make its way to Gaul. And then Vindex would have to issue his own coin in response. And that coin of Vindex is actually, as we will see, his most popular type. Not enough time, Cray says. However, there's been a lot of recent research on these anonymous coins. And I think if we apply that research to the question of the Eagle and Standards types, we can revive the idea of these as Civil War coins. So the first relevant work here is Peter Hugo Martin who does a iconographic analysis and die study of all of the anonymous coins. And his conclusion is that those five groups are groundless. The stylistic variation, which is what we use to put them in five groups, Martin argues is far greater within the groups than between the groups. Therefore, Martin concludes that all of the coins were a single group minted by Galba. Now, at various points in this talk, including about 30 seconds from now, I am going to criticize Martin's idea that they are all from Galba. But why I think Martin's work is so important for thinking about all these coins is in part that he makes us question those initial assumptions because these are anonymous coins. Nothing on the coin itself clearly assigns it to one of those five groups. And so we need to revisit those categories as new evidence appears. In the last decade, new evidence did appear with Butcher and Ponting's metrological study, which has implications for both the anonymous coins and Nero's coins. I'll talk about the anonymous one first. So apologies to Martin, but they found that there are in fact at least two groups of anonymous coins. Some coins were made with Spanish bullion and some with Gallic. But as Butcher and Ponting are quick to point out, the fact that coins were made with Gallic metal does not have to mean that Vindex personally orchestrated their minting. It's perfectly plausible, perhaps, that Vindex began minting these coins, but that when he passed away in mid-May, Galba continued minting them. After all, Galba was still rebelling against Nero and still had soldiers to pay. Second, Butcher and Ponting affect our dating of Nero's eagle and standards. Nero debases the denarius, and Butcher and Ponting show that he does so in four stages, and that the Eagle and Standards type is, in fact, from the last stage, which they date, to the year 68. So that brings us to a revised chronology. Nero's coin came sometime in 68. Now, this means that if we want to think about it as Cray does, as being about maybe the execution of Corbulo and some other generals, it's a year late. Why would he wait a year to do that? On the other hand, it now means that the interval between when the rebel eagle and standards could first appear in March and when Galba stops minting anonymous coins in August is now five months, which I think makes it much more plausible that both Nero and Vindex or Galba are minting these coins in conversation with each other. But okay, so we've dated both of these to the Civil War. Why does that matter? Well, before we can get into the intent behind the coin, 
I think I have to briefly talk about one of the largest elephants in the room and can of worms in uh, Roman imperial numismatics and iconography. Who picked the type? I don't intend to fully settle this question here, but it's worth thinking about the implications. So one idea in recent scholarship, uh, which starts with the work of Barbara Levick, but has been carried on by other scholars such as Aaron Nathan Elkins, uh, talks about coins as being in some sense panegyric. The emperor is not picking the types, but is rather part of the audience for the types. And this makes a lot of sense if we think about Nero resurrecting a coin of Antony's, because after all, all of those stories were things told about both Nero and Antony, right? This is clearly a comparison on people's minds, possibly one that would flatter Nero. But I don't think that the emperor can possibly be the only audience for these types. After all, the literary sources are clear in their belief that the emperor picked the coin types. I don't mean to suggest by this that I think that Nero is personally picking this coin type. He's busy. Whether that is to say he's off singing somewhere or he's planning a war, either way, he has more important things to personally do. But part of what is so exciting about these legionary coins is that for once, we actually have a pretty clear idea of audience. If we date this coin to a civil war and it has a military theme, I think it's fair to say this coin was probably used to pay soldiers. In the literary evidence and its uniformity in the idea that people thought that the emperor picked the coin types, suggests the soldiers would read this as a message from Nero. Okay, so what message are they getting? The main message on this coin, besides being Nero as a descendant of Antony, we should say in this great line of Romans as opposed to Vindex, what line is he coming from, is the message of the Roman legions themselves. The eagle and standards are the ultimate symbol of the legions. And this is so important for Nero when you think about his opposition. Because Vindex's forces are not legions. They're an illegal levy that Vindex conducted in Gaul. Galba in Spain, meanwhile, has one genuine legion at his command and a second legion that, again, he illegally levied. So Nero's message is, that is a rabble. On my side, we have the actual legions of the Roman Empire. How does Galba respond to that? Well, his response has several parts, so let's pick this coin apart. First, you might notice the altar between the eagle and the standard on the right. The altar most obviously refers to the worship of the legionary eagle, but it also seems to suggest the gods support Galba and not Nero. And that accords well with what we read in Suetonius, who talks about portents such as ships full of arms washing up on Spanish shores that Galba uses to establish that his cause is beloved by the gods and Nero is their enemy. Second, note the hand atop the standards. Now, some Roman standards were topped by hands. Uh, standards had different ornaments on them, and this makes sense when you remember that soldiers are supposed to follow these into battle, which means they can't look identical. The hand is also, however, a symbol of loyalty, uh, as we see in Pliny and a bunch of other literary sources. This is not a full list. It's fair to say that when you put the hand on a standard, it, contain, it continues that idea of fides or loyalty. So by putting a standard on his coin with a hand on it, Galba is making a claim about the actual loyalty of the legions. Their true faith is to him. And this is particularly interesting because later in the year of the four emperors, fides as symbolized by clasped hands is going to be all over the Roman coinage. This is actually kind of a precursor to that. But neither of those are the most exciting way that Galba responds to Nero. The most exciting way he responds is with the legend, Signa PR, the standards of the Roman people. Yeah, there are soldiers fighting for Nero, but that's not the army of the Roman people. The army of the Roman people is with me, Galba. And that republicanizing, popularizing move is incredibly common for Galba. Uh, he also, for instance, takes victory of Augustus and turns it into victory of the Roman people. He does the same thing with many, many other types. Now, as I said, this is the rebels' most common reverse, and it is paired with most of their obverses, such as Mars, the spirit of the Roman people, peace and liberty, and so forth. So we can see this idea tying disparate themes of the rebels' political program together. More than that, I think we can think of this coin 
or at, sorry, as, of the standards as instrumental. The obverse is an ideal, peace and liberty, but how are we gonna obtain that? Will you turn the coin over? Oh, the army of the Roman people is what's going to bring us peace and liberty. Of course, it's the year of the four emperors. Galba is not alone in opposing Nero. And still in 68, so before we even get to the year of the four emperors proper, his first opponent is Clodius Macro. Now, the literary sources tell us a little about Macro. He's the legate of a legion in Africa, and when he rebels, he raises a second legion, so another illegal levy. Part of his strategy is to occupy Carthage and try and cut off Roman grain. He's interested in Sicily, though it doesn't seem like he ever actually gets control of the island. And ultimately, he's going to be assassinated on Galba's orders. What the literary sources do not do is give us a great idea of what Clodius Macro was trying to accomplish. Because of that, scholars have suggested various goals. Was he trying to become emperor himself? Set up a separate African kingdom? Restore the Republic? Or maybe help Nero somehow? Well, if we look at the coins themselves, I think we can see a pretty clear answer. To begin, Macker lionizes Africa. So on the coin on the left, you can see a bust of Africa identifiable by her elephant skin headdress. And on the right, you have a lion. Now, this is exciting not only for the depiction of Africa and Roman coins, but for what it says about who Macker's responding to. Here, Macker's responding to and adopting Galban propaganda just as Galba is adopting Nero's messaging. Because at the same time, Galba is lionizing Spain and Gaul for their role in his resistance. And the fact that they're celebrating the provinces is actually really unusual. These are, in fact, the first positive descriptions of provinces on Roman imperial coinage. And in that, have a lot more in common with what Hadrian's going to do the next century to celebrate the provinces than they do with how the provinces are next going to appear on Roman coinage, which is to say, as captives on Vespasian's coins. But we should not conclude from the fact that Macro puts Africa on coins that he's an African separatist. He also puts Roma on coins. And more broadly, he embraces Republican rhetoric. You might notice that Africa is identified as liberatrix. This is Africa the liberator. And like Galba, he does coins with the personification of liberty visible here on the right. He also does several archaizing touches that Galba only occasionally dabbles in, such as writing his name in the genitive, which is something that was done on Republican coins, but emperors write their name in the nominative. Finally, he writes SC by the decree of the Senate on all of his coins, even though they're silver and SC is usually used on bronze. But again, it's this ostentatious deference toward the Republican past and senatorial authority. So should we conclude that Macker is trying to restore the Republic? Well, no. And first of all, we should be careful about assuming in this period that Republican ideology means you're attempting to restore the Republic because Galba himself uses a lot of Republican ideology and becomes emperor, as Macker was trying to do. Macker puts his own name and portrait on a coin. This is something that for 100 years has been an imperial prerogative, much less when it is on a coin you were using to pay a legion, much less a legion that you were legally levied. No part of this is even vaguely legal under the empire or conceivable at this point as anything besides an attempt to supplant Nero. And that brings us to the legions. So Macro raises two legions, or he has one legion and he raises a second, and he mints coins for them. And these are actually the majority of the coins he mentioned, he mints are gonna have legionary reverses. And as some of the coins specify, he calls both of his legions, like Africa, liberatrix. So again, we can see a response to Galba. Yes, Nero's a tyrant and has to be dethroned, but he's not gonna be dethroned by your legions in Gaul. He's gonna be dethroned by Africa the Liberator and my Liberator Legions. Now, both legions get the obverses of Africa in the line. And the glorification of Africa might have been especially exciting to the first legion. So in this period of Roman history, legions are never supposed to fight in the area where they were recruited. But Macker has to have recruited the first legion from Africa because after all, he has control of nowhere else which means these soldiers might be particularly excited by the idea of, in some sense, fighting under Africa's banner. Meanwhile, liberty only appears on coins of the first legion and victory only on coins of the third. 
This might then be a very early appearance of a legion's emblem or symbol on coins. I should note here, we don't actually have any other examples of liberty as a legionary emblem. But if you were to think of a single time where you might have an exception, the year of the four emperors is about as good a candidate as you could want. As I said, though, Macker is not terribly successful in his attempt. Meanwhile, back in Rome, Galba has become emperor. He continues minting eagle and standards types, but he also mints three standards types. In Kai Terpfer's book on standards, the most comprehensive work on Roman standards since the 1800s, uh, Terpfer identifies this as a composite standard. So the idea is, unlike the other coins, which are centered around the legionary eagle, this coin isn't just about the legions, but is celebrating the whole Roman armed forces the legions, the auxiliaries, the fleet, as you can see with the prows. And this is a type that both Vitellius and Vespasian take up, in some case, even reusing Galba's dies. And I think the message there is clear, because as soon as Galba is assassinated, both Vitellius and soon Vespasian declare themselves Galba's avengers. This is incredible, because at the time, Vitellius had been fighting a war against Galba, but let bygones be bygones. By reusing Galba's three standards design, they say that the Roman army is now following them, just as it followed Galba, and they have succeeded him in that position. Vespasian also mints an interesting variant shown here on the right, which is to say a three standards type with superimposed upon it those class pans loyalty coins I mentioned. Meanwhile, there are two other coins from the year of the four emperors that have the name of legions. Now, these coins are very problematic for reasons I'm going to get into and might be ancient imitations. But if they are genuine, they have implications that haven't yet been really understood and suggest that Vitellius might have done his own series of legionary coins. So this coin, as you can see from the obverse, is one of those Augustus anonymous coins. And the reverse shows a running lion and reads Legion 16. Presumably this is, if we don't count the macro ones, the earliest legionary emblem we see on a coin. But the history of Legion 16 is interesting. It fights for Nero's general, Virginius Rufus, against Vindex. It then fights for Vitellius against Galba. It then is disbanded in the Batavian Revolt after its defeat in that revolt. What this means is there is no moment in which Galba can have minted an anonymous coin for the 16th legion. This coin then must have been vented not by Galba, but by Vitellius. And we know he have done so because Tacitus tells us that Vitellius's general Valens gave his soldiers a small donative on the march to Rome. Maybe he did so in legionary coins. As I said, though, there are some problems. In 2000, Christopher Earhart dismissed the entire Augustus group as ancient forgeries. Many of them are plated and they survive in fewer specimens than other anonymous coins. I'm not entirely sure that we should throw the group out, however. As Dorian Bacciarelli has recently argued, Vitellius was not an emperor in Rome with the treasury, he was a usurper in, with the German armies. If we were to ever expect a Roman in a quasi-official position to do an emergency issue with plated coins, it's surely Vitellius whom we would think would do so. Moreover, while we only have three specimens of this coin, one of which is plated, I think it's noteworthy the two that I've been able to see photographs of are clearly not from the same die, which does suggest some volume. And if we regard the Legion 16 coin as part of an otherwise lost Vitellian legionary series, then that is an interesting implication for how we read this. This is a coin for the 15th Legion. Now, the 15th Legion has the same unit history as the 16th, which is to say it fights for Nero and then Vitellius, and then it loses to the Batavian rebels. Now, the standard attribution of this coin actually assigns it to those rebels and says they meant it to celebrate beating the 15th Legion. I think Peter Hugo Martin is right, however, that the evidence that these rebels mint coins is actually extremely weak. Because these coins are iconographically and stylistically very, very similar to all of the other anonymous coins from the year. So why are we assuming that these are the coins from a native revolt? However, if we discount the idea that the Batavians minted them, 
like the Corona 16th Legion, it must have been minted by Vitellius. Like I said, this is the most speculative portion of my talk, and I'm certainly open to uh, other ideas on what we could do with these odd coins. Uh, that we only have coins for two legions is unfortunate if we think Vitellius did a legionary series, but it doesn't rule out the idea because we have them in such small numbers that coins for other legions might have just been lost. Okay, I'm going to go more quickly over the period of peace to get back to civil wars and unhappy times for the Romans. But the Eagle and Standards coins under the Flavians and Antonines become somewhat domesticated. So Vespasian continues to mint both Standard Eagle and Standards coins and those Eagle and Standards class hands coins that I showed you. But in the early 70s, the reference changes. Because seeing this, people would no longer think of the year of the four emperors, but rather of the triumph in Judea, which Vespasian and Titus celebrate in the year 71. So this iconography is now being rebranded for foreign wars, which are a lot safer to celebrate. That doesn't have the bloody aroma of killing your fellow Romans. More broadly, the type even becomes dissociated from particular victories or even from military pay. The coin here is actually a Sestophorus, something that you would not be using to pay soldiers at this period. And in fact, Titus, Domitian, Nerva, and Trajan all meant Eagle and Standard Sestophorus. And unless we're thinking of a continuous string of victories, it then seems like these are less celebrating a particular battle than more of a general glory of the Roman army kind of coin. Not entirely dissimilar, perhaps, from a peace or victory coin. Now, it is toward the end of this period of peace that Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Verus return to Antony's original legionary coins, and in fact, restore Antony's coin for the sixth legion. There have been two recent uh, die studies of this by Martin Beckman and Martin Baer with diametrically opposed conclusions. <laughs> so Martin Beckman suggests that obviously Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Verus are not saying, we're the next Mark Antony. You don't really want to be the next Mark Antony. But remember how common legionary coins are. So according to Martin Beckman, what they're doing is restoring a common coin type that everybody's handled Mark Antony legionary coins, but they're so worn. So Mark Sirius and Lucius Verus are basically restoring a part of Roman daily life. Martin Verus says, no, it's about Lucius Verus's victories in the Parthenon. I think the fact that these coin, that these types, sorry, that these eagle and standards and legionary types have actually been used since Mark Antony and in fact have been infrequent issue since the year of the four emperors to celebrate military victory strongly supports Bear's idea that this is in fact about the Parthian war. To that, I will add, nobody wants to just be the next Mark Antony at this period. But that's not to say you can't be better than Mark Antony. Because after all, Mark Antony conspicuously failed to win against Parthia while Lucius Verus succeeded. But this brings us to the year of the five emperors. So in brief, Commodus, the last Antonine emperor, is strangled on the last night of 192. His successor, Pertinax, visible in the top left here, rules for only three months before the Praetorians murder him. Didius Julianus gets the empire in the infamous auction of the empire. And this is so tremendously unpopular that three people immediately rebel. Septimius Severus, Clodius Albinus, and Piscanius Niger. Now, Clodius Albinus and Severus unite for just long enough to defeat Piscanius before Severus turns on his erstwhile ally and becomes emperor. In this military civil war context, it's probably unsurprising that both Clodius and Piscanius mint eagle and standards coins and celebrate the fides, the loyalty of their soldiers. What is more interesting is that Severus is going to do the most ambitious series of legionary coins since Antony. Now, Severus's coins all allude to start to Pertinax, and they do so because on the obverse, Severus's titulature at this period includes the name Pertinax. And it does so on all of his coins of this period, or most of them. But it has a particular point on military coins, because Pertinax had been a famous general of Marcus Aurelius. And Severus, when rallying his soldiers and persuading them to support his claim to the throne, had used the fact that some of those soldiers had served under Pertinax to support the idea, well, then you need to help me avenge him. Severus's connection to Marcus Aurelius is, of course, well known. 
a few years from now, Severus is even going to go so far as to claim that he is the adopted son of the, at this point, long dead Marcus Aurelius. Well, this coin is actually the first link between the two. And the link is clear because Marcus Aurelius is the last person to do a legionary coin. More than that, he's the last person to put standards of any sort on a coin. Commodus only does standards on a medallion, so few people would have seen that. Severus mints coins for 15 of his 16 legions, which suggests the 16th legion, 10 gemina, coins were probably made for it, but we either haven't found them or we've misidentified them. Unsurprisingly, he does not mint coins for the legions of his opponents. But that is an interesting ramification. I think part of the point of Severus's series of coins is that if you were a Roman and you were handling these coins just in the process of your daily life, it will dawn on you that Severus has at his command so many legions. He has 16. That is more than Piscanius and Clodius have put together. So the coins kind of show his overwhelming military force. But though there are coins for each legion, the legions are not treated the same. Only three legions have coins minted at other mints, Alexandria and probably a mint at Amessa. And only the 14th legion has coins in both gold, silver, and bronze. That is one of many signs that the 14th legion appears to be Severus's favorite. And that makes sense because the 14th legion was stationed at Carnuntum, which is where Severus is acclaimed emperor by his soldiers. Putting two and two together, it was probably the 14th legion that acclaimed him as emperor. Now, it used to be thought that we only had gold auri for three legions, the 14th, the 1st, and the 8th, and that these were another mark of honor for those legions and the officers in them. In recent decades, we've actually found two more auri uh, for the 4th and the 22nd legion, which suggests to me they were probably minted for all of the legions, but in small quantities, so we just don't have them all. And that brings me to the other way that Severus's coins are extremely ambitious. These are the very first coins to attempt to differentiate legions, not just by writing a different number on the coin, but by showing a different standard. The problem is the attempt is a complete mess. <laughs> uh, as Vermeeren shows in this table is from his excellent article on legionary coins, The same standard is used for multiple legions and the same legion will sometimes get different standards. From looking at the coins in the ANS collection and on Ochre, I can say Vermeer, if anything, understates how wildly inconsistent the depiction of these standards are. But this raises another point that's been kind of lurking in the background of this talk. Do the standards on coins generally correspond to a particular standard that the viewer could identify? Like, could the viewer look at a coin and say, oh, that's the standard for the 14th legion. Now, Rossi and Cray argue that they could. In that recent book on standards I mentioned, Turfer argues that they could not. And I think he's correct. I think standards on coins are standardized. They're there to suggest the idea of a standard rather than a particular standard. Why? Well, Turfer points out two reasons. First, standards were numerous. A legion didn't have one standard. It had something like 60. And it had to, because as we've established, soldiers have to follow these into battle, and you want your soldiers to follow a battle plan more complicated than everybody go that way. Second, standards change. So the elements on the standards, these discs, the half moons you've been seeing, those are military awards. What that means, though, is that if you minted a coin for a legion, and you depicted the standard accurately, and then the legion fought another battle and won another award, its standard would change and your coin would now be inaccurate. And that's especially a problem because these coins tend to be minted in times of war, which is exactly when you would expect more awards to be awarded. To Turfer's argument, I'm going to add that the standards on coins seem to me to be simplified. Now, to be fair, in relief sculpture, we do see standards that look exactly like we see on Antony's coins. So these might be a real but minority type of standard, or they might also be simplified because the vast majority of relief sculpture standards that I've seen are far more complicated than we see on coins. Something like twice as many military awards are shown. And I actually think that makes sense because coins are small. 
you can only show so many military awards before they become completely indistinct. And as we saw, the attempt to go further than that with Severus is a mess. But there's something else interesting on Severus's standards. You might notice jutting out of the sides are these two little animals, these Capricorns. Now those are not in the Roman imperial coinage descriptions. But they were first noticed on coins of the 14th Legion by Mattingly, who thought it was a particular mark of honor for that legion. Since then, some scholars have said there are no Capricorns. Well, some have said there are Capricorns on all or almost all legions coins. And when I started looking into this a few months ago, I thought, how can there possibly be disagreement about such a binary question? I'll just go look at the coins and see the answer. It was more complicated than that, it turns out. Uh, but what I did was I went through all of the coins on ochre and I recorded how many of them had Capricorns. And I only add non-ochre coins here when either a coin or sorry, a type as Capricorn sometimes represented, but not in the ochre sample, or when a scholar like Steve Pazic has seen them, uh, even if I have personally not. Now, this is obviously not comprehensive. I did not look at every legionary specimen we have, but my hope is that it shows an idea of the overall pattern, especially because I have no reason to believe the ochre coins were chosen because they did or did not have Capricorns. All right. First conclusion from this, like the depiction of the standards, the depiction of Capricorns is a complete mess. There is only one legion for which Capricorns are never attested, but there are only two legions for which they're in the majority. Unfortunate. And from that, if you want to conclude that the majority of these are simply errors, you have grounds to do so. And if nothing else, I hope this chart explains why there's been disagreement in previous scholarship. Whether a scholar thought that Allegiance coins at Capricorns depended entirely on which specimens he or she had access to. But the pattern isn't totally random. First of all, the chart shows that the 14th Legion is clearly supposed to have Capricorns. And I say that because they are in the majority of their coins, and that is the case at multiple mints and across all three maps. It's probably not a coincidence. But the 14th Legion isn't actually the most consistent. The third legion is actually the one that has Capricorns most consistently, and like the 14th, is a legion honored by coins at multiple mints. I've so far not been able to see a picture of the coin from the Alexandrian mint, unfortunately. I'd be very curious if it has a Capricorn. If you know, please tell me. Uh -huh. But okay, you, you could then ask, well, why, why Capricorns? Why do we care? Well, the first reason we might see Capricorns is that they're the legionary emblem for the 14th legion. It was refounded after Actium by Augustus, who combined it with one of Antony's legions, hence the title Gemina or Twin. And like a lot of legions, Augustus founded or refounded it as a Capricorn. But more broadly, Capricorns recall Augustus. And people have been minting Capricorns on coins to recall Augustus basically since Tiberius. <laughs> um, so here we see a coin of Nerva that restores a coin of Augustus to Capricorn. But Closer to Severus's own time, Piscenius Niger is using Capricorns on coins to signify Augustus. And in fact, Severus would be particularly attuned to this kind of symbolism because we know he's interested in astrology. And more than that, Alison Cooley has an article where she shows Severus's interest in comparing himself to Augustus as another emperor who marched on Rome to, he planned, set up a glorious dynasty. This would actually be the earliest Severus Augustus comparison, predating by several years anything else in Alison Cooley's article. So that's really exciting. And even if we think the, the uh, Capricorns are only in coins of the 14th Legion, and it's the legionary emblem, we can still ask, well, why does Severus commemorate them in that way? And I think Augustus is the answer. But that it is to reference Augustus becomes very clear if we assume that they're intentionally also depicted on coins of the third legion, because the emblem of the third legion was not a Capricorn. So there it's clearly Augustus, not a legionary emblem. And the final thing that's so exciting if we read these Capricorns as an allusion to Augustus is that for once we see not only an emperor's self-presentation or their connection to Augustus, but we see the response to it. Because Severus in June 193 gets to Rome and dethrones Didius Julianus, and he pays his soldiers a donative, presumably in these very legionary coins. And his soldiers are angry. 
They demand more money. Specifically, they demand the 10,000 sesterces that Augustus gave his soldiers. In other words, they take Severus's example and they throw it back in his face. Yeah, you're like Augustus. Well, then pay us like Augustus. Okay, Severus is not by any means the last person to mint legionary coins. However, by the time we have the next big series of legionary coins, it is with Gallienus. And he doesn't use our traditional eagle and standards iconography, but instead does the emblems of each legion. It's a fascinating series with its own weird problems that I'm trying to work my head around. Uh, but I think it's clearly at this point doing something different. So I end my argument of the kind of reception of Antony's coins and how it ties in civil war with Severus. So in conclusion, yes, these coins do tie back to Antony and especially in their early years when people like Nero are minting them. But they also refer to other legionary coins such as Severus using his legionary coin to compare himself to Marcus Aurelius. And they also are deeply, deeply intertwined with the rest of the issuing emperor's messenger. As we saw, for instance, with Clodius Macker and Africa or Galba and Liberty or Severus and Augustus. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, any questions or comments for discussion with Dr. Katz? Feel free to unmute yourself. Hey there. Ben Lee. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Enjoyed that very much. Um, I noticed you didn't say anything <clears throat> about the legionary standards that appear under the Republic. Yes. Uh, that was just because I wanted to fit this into 50 minutes and not keep you here all day. Um, yeah, so my main interest is kind of the imperial reception of these, but the Republican story of them is certainly more complicated. Uh, and several people issue these in the first century uh, BCE. And I think Antony kind of t steals their thunder just by minting so many of these. Uh, but that is not to diminish the importance of people like uh, Gaius Valerius Flaccus, who actually comes up with the type to celebrate his troops acclaiming him imperator or anything like that. Thank you. Well, I would uh, point out one thing. <clears throat> the, uh, the type of... Uh, what was it? Valerius Flaccus um, has a uh, winged bust of victory on the obverse. So it, this type is copied exactly by Clodius Masser. So uh, I, I think there's some connection there. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. Uh, and two, I don't know, the to the people in antiquity who are themselves like proto numismatist, Valerius Flaccus isn't totally forgotten because actually Trajan does uh, two restoration uh, eagle and standards types, and one of them is Valerius Flaccus's. So mm -hmm. some people are aware. Actually, this type goes before Anton. So that's in, it's a good point that Macker's is very similar. Thank you. Oh, uh, from the chat, I saw, is Gallienus the last emperor to issue legionary types? Uh, no, he's not. Actually, several people in the third century issue them, uh, and they do so like Gallienus using legionary emblems. Uh, and these types are interesting and very confusing because it, third century is, after all, when the empire is splitting at several periods. And what we see is are emperors issuing complete series of legionary coins, including legions that, so far as we can tell, they do not at the time control. There's very serious that I cannot claim that I have a great explanation for it, but it is fascinating in its own right. Thank you. Thank you. What do you think about the uh, the fourth century where you have uh, soldiers standing between standards like um, Constantine and Gloria and Zerkatus? How do you think that fits in or does it not fit in? 
I think it does. I think it... So I haven't looked in like close detail about when those appear, but I think that most obviously is kind of the final evolution of what we saw with like the Flavians around those Sistafri celebrating not like a particular civil war emperor, but just this type to celebrate the power of the Roman army and how best to get that across, but Gloria Exercitus. Uh, and since Eagle and Standards types keep being minted as time goes on, yeah, it, it seems plausible to me that that's kind of the final evolution of it. There are tetradrams of Roman Egypt under Numerian and Carinus that mention Legion II. Do you know anything about that? I'm sorry to say I don't. I, I'll go look into it now. It sounds interesting, but I don't. <laughs> I can send you images. Oh, please. Thank you. Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.